morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And actually, our panelists uh, are on three different continents today. Um, I'm Nicolas Veron. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce this session of the financial statement series at the Peterson Institute with um, the two best speakers I can think of for our topic of global infrastructure in a context which is moving fast. Of course, geopolitics, which we will um, discuss, uh, technology, and a number of other transformations that are going on these days. Um, Mark Bale of CLS um, Group and uh, Sopnendu Mohanty uh, of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mass. Uh, Mark Bale uh, studied uh, initially in business administration with a, a bachelor's degree at Pace University in New York in 1987. Uh, he then joined the French uh, uh, Central Securities Depo Depository, which at the time was called SICOVAM now a part of Euroclear, uh, where he was a senior executive for almost 10 years. And he did a master's degree in finance at CERAM, which is based in the south of France, but actually it's a business school in Paris. Graduated in 1997, and I have to say with a specialization in audit and post-market infrastructure, which to me are the two most sexy uh, graduation uh, themes that I can think of. And I'm saying this seriously. Um, he then joined the ECB in May 1997. That wasn't the ECB, actually. It was the European Monetary Institute, but it was about to become the ECB, so present at the creation very much, uh, working in market infrastructure uh, a lot on the Target 2 securities project in the mid-2000s and eventually in 2014. Uh, Director General for Market Infrastructure and Payments, a, a position he held for five years until 2019, when he was uh, then replaced by Ulrich Binzal, who also uh, has spoken recently in the series. Uh, in December 2019, Mark Bale became the chief executive of CLS Group. He will explain what CLS is. It's very important. He also has a lot of international coordination and policy experience, not least as a member of the Committee on Payment and uh, Settlement uh, uh, and Oh, uh, settlement Systems, I think, the old name, CPSS, uh, which then became the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure, CPMI, at the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, so Pnandu Mohanty uh, studied uh, initially in India, a bachelor's degree uh, at uh, Utkal University in Bhubaneswar in Odisha uh, in 1993, and then in 95, a master's degree in information science at Biola Institute of Technology in Ranchi in uh, the state of Jharkhand. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Uh, so he then started a career as a software engineer. Uh, in 1997, he entered a city um, in Tokyo, uh, where he uh, led a number of different projects and positions, uh, ending uh, that uh, tenure in 2014, 2015, at, as head of the Global Consumer Lab Networks and Programs for the entire city group. In August of 2015, he joined uh, the MAS, the central bank in Singapore, the Monetary Authority, as chief uh, fintech officer. Uh, he's also associated with National University of Singapore and with the Shanghai University of Finance and Economics in China. Uh, he has a number of board positions, including at Proxterra, an e-commerce uh, platform, uh, and at Elevandi, a nonprofit um, platform sponsored by the Monetary Authority and in Singapore. Uh, and uh, is uh, what I guess in uh, technology is called a guru uh, in everything fintech. So um, a lot to discuss. I will actually um, introduce the slides for technical reasons for Mark. So Mark, you have to tell me when to move the slides for you. Uh, I hope everybody can see them. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Nicolas. Good day to everyone. Pleasure to be with you uh, in this session and to introduce you. Uh, so, what is CLS and why I believe it is interesting in the context of uh, global uh, financial markets to consider uh, the context in which we operate. So, CLS, uh, CLS Bank, is in fact there to reduce FX settlement system. And thank you, yes, to move to the purpose. We have been created by the market for the market under the in fact, uh, impulsion of CPSS, who now is a CPMI, as you just mentioned, uh, Nicola. And uh, just here, you can see on this slide our basically uh, purpose statement. Uh, so our role is to strengthen the resilience and efficiency in the FX ecosystems through global oversight and mutual ownership. It's interesting. So we are one amongst, and I would stay on this slide a minute if you, uh, uh, Nicola, uh, um, the, the one, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, we are one amongst other, in fact, uh, financial market infrastructure, which have this 
global reach. FX, by definition, is global. So basically, it's uh, interconnecting different currencies. But we are not the only one in this space to serve the global uh, somehow economy and the functioning of the global uh, system, financial system. Other like us are in a similar situation to be in a context which is today very challenging. Challenging because of the context of uh, uh, the geopolitical tension which exists, uh, the, not to mention it, the Russian war. Uh, against Ukraine and the sanctions which have been uh, uh, derived from this are changing the notion of global and seeing what it means to be in this uh, global environment. Uh, I, I would associate so therefore to my uh, context and what I will say afterwards, what it will be more specific to the CLS uh, context and the settlement of the tax market is similar for probably quite a few other financial market infrastructure critical service provider also in this space like SWIFT, uh, also trading venues eventually or clearing houses which are dealing with multi-jurisdictional and multi-currency context would have similar, I would say, challenges than the one we have uh, in CLS. Now, what is CLS more specifically? And thanks to move to the next slide, Nicolas. Uh, in a few numbers, uh, uh, so we are a systemically important uh, DFMU, as it is called under the US law, so Designated Financial Market Utility. Uh, we are settling on average the equivalent of 6 trillion of US dollar. Uh, in fact, a bit more these uh, days as uh, the market is uh, very active in a context where macroeconomy and uh, uh, geopolitical context makes uncertainty. The market is moving a lot. We have, uh, if I should say, only settlement members uh, in, the in the about 70, 74 70, uh, settlement members, which are the key banks active in the FX market. We are active on 18 currencies, uh, which are the main currencies that are being traded. And I'll come to that later, which is a point I want to make there. We are missing some names in this list that uh, you would guess are on the list when you see uh, the uh, functioning of our global economy in general. We are interconnecting 30,000, in fact, parties into our uh, network uh, indirectly through our settlement members. And as I mentioned uh, in our statement, we are overseen in a global way. So it's a very important for us that all central banks, which are uh, giving us the responsibility to settle in their currencies directly in central bank money, are, I would say, contributing to the oversight of uh, our activity. And so it's 23 because the euro is a complex one uh, with multiple central banks. But so uh, otherwise, each of the uh, central banks are, are looking at us. What are we delivering, really, uh, just to understand the systemic relevance of what we are doing? Next slide, Nicolas, please. Uh, is uh, we are delivering what we call a mechanism of PVP or payment versus payment. Very simply, is that if you pay in in a currency, so the example on this slide between Bank A and B is a euro against a US dollar. Uh, you are sure that if you pay your leg in your currency, you will receive the other currency and the other leg. So we ensure this uh, so that there is no principal risk in between the parties in this context. Again, if you relate this to the six trillion settled every day, obviously this has a very relevant systemic risk in the context in which we operate. If you could move uh, two slides forward, uh, uh, Nicola, I mean, this one, uh, the one in between is just mentioning the, the value of uh, the service we are making, but for the value of time, I want to spend more time eventually on the next one. We are seeing that if you look at the list of turnover in trading, uh, trading activities uh, I mentioned on this slide, uh, that we are missing some currency. So the one we are highlighted in blue are the one that we are settling. And the one we are highlighted uh, in white or not highlighted somehow are the ones which are not settled today through CLS. If they are not settled, it's because they are complex to bring in and because the mechanism we are proposing to settle is based on very strong legal enforceability, both of the netting process we are proposing for the settlement and as well uh, on the, uh, I would say, uh, cross-border dimension, so the finality element of the settlement, which is very important. When it's final, the settlement cannot be challenged. This requires a strong, uh, I would say, cohesion of the regulatory, legal, and technical context in which those currencies are operated. And today, we see it only in those 18 currencies which are now uh, connected uh, to our settlement system. We are missing one, you see number eight, which is very clear, China. We are missing afterwards, uh, if I would skip India in a certain way, which is a non-deliverable currency. Uh, we are missing uh, Russia, uh, and uh, I will not comment on that at this stage. The next one is Turkish Lira, and the next few ones are either not deliverable or less systemically uh, relevant. 
you will appreciate that this was 2019 numbers is the numbers produced by the BIS in their tri-annual survey on the FX uh, market. We will get the new number of 22 uh, soon in a month or two uh, will be published. And we expect that eventually uh, this number will increase further on those currencies. Uh, which uh, are very active in the global economy, as we can see. We estimate today, for, for just an illustration, that uh, the settlement on the Chinese currency represents probably every day about uh, 600 to 800 billion USD equivalent being settled. Uh, uh, be careful that it's double number because you have to settle in both currencies, in the Chinese currency and in the USD currencies. Here, the numbers you see are trading uh, uh, more type of numbers. So the relation between trading and settlement is not so straightforward depending on the instrument that is being traded on. But just to give an illustration, those numbers are very big. And uh, in the context where we have seen recently the development and the purpose, so the question I would like to ask to, to discuss and to exchange with you, uh, Nicola, and, uh, is what do we do? Uh, what the policy maker should consider? Is it uh, more relevant to bring in uh, financial market infrastructure to be able to service safely uh, those currencies which are not yet interconnected? Or uh, do, we, uh, uh, do we prefer to live with the risks of the systemic implication of not being connected? So should market infrastructure, should critical service providers in this space be a, a neutral place where we can exchange safely uh, things uh, rather than uh, letting it as uh, uncertainty which uh, uh, remain in a systemic context. It's a bit the trade-off uh, that uh, I would be happy to do. And just to finish on my last slide before triggering eventually the debate, the, the next slide is showing how we have tried to resolve it so far. So we have developed a service which do everything but settlement for those currencies. And we see it is being uh, uh, appreciated by the market, so they are using it, but it does not resolve the PVP uh, part. So it does acquire, allow acquiring the trades. It does allow matching the trade. It does allow as well uh, calculating bilateral net position in between parties to simplify the settlement, but it does not go to the settlement piece because it would require interconnection with those countries, which today uh, is not uh, technically and uh, legally and regulatory uh, available. And that's a question I am raising today, if you allow me. Just maybe a last number I think I have not mentioned. For the six trillion we settle every day, because of the netting capacity we have built in our system and the multilateral netting that we are using, we need only 60 billion liquidity. So 1% of liquidity to settle growth uh, with finality and without principal risk, the whole of those trades. What we would want is to get the same level of efficiency for the market also for those uh, currencies and safety for the market. So that would be my introductionary uh, uh, remarks, Nicola, and uh, happy to, to discuss with you and uh, the panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That was superb. Um, and one thing I forgot to say in the introduction, but it's not too late to say, is that I have a, a personal interest in the world of financial infrastructure as an independent non-executive board member of the trade repository arm of DTCC, but that's a very different kind of infrastructure. So we're, we're, we're probably not going to discuss trade repositories a lot today, so I don't think that uh, taints me too much. Uh, so over to you. Well, um... Well, my intervention is uh, less about uh, a particular example Mark articulated. Well, let me reflect on this global market infrastructure. I think we spoke uh, before this. It's so amazing to we, we take this thing for uh, as something uh, to be questioned because these are messaging systems. They're not the actual uh, systems running in the front end or the back end. So imagine these messaging systems are talking to a whole set of legacy, non-legacy infrastructure of different vintages across multiple countries. Sometimes we, we, should, we should take a pause and appreciate what SWIFT does, what CLS does as, as a global infrastructure, just able to communicate across different systems, processes, legal construct, you know, and different regulatory uh, 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 differences across jurisdictions. In, a, in, a, in my last five years uh, or seven years now as a chief fintech officer, I looked at market infrastructure in different uh, segment of, of consumer. I, I know at this point, I think what Mark is broadly articulating is a large value corporate segment, inter, interbank settlements at that scale. We also need to understand that most of the recent discussion around 
looking at alternate global infrastructure or looking at new innovation in this space has not come from large interbank settlement process because it's fairly efficient as it stands today. The real op the opportunity which, was, which people are talking are coming from small value remittance kind of use cases because those while, while at a transaction size may not be that big, but collectively they affect billions and billions of people who send money across, across border through global remittances, small merchants receiving payments across the border. And those today cannot, uh, if you think about the cost of the transfer, the access to financial infrastructure in many markets is, is, is still not there. And they need an alternate super efficient system to ride on. And what you see as an innovation over the last five to six years are different private players or sometimes government G2G uh, partnership are being laid out, which comes as a front end innovation and sometimes as a back end innovation, still talking to the SWIFT network, still soft talking to the CLS infrastructures on the back end, but they are providing the front end and the back end simplification so that this set of segment of population do participate in the global financial uh, system for them to move money or do financial transactions. So that's one part of why, why you hear and see a lot of discussion around alternate payment rails, alternate way of doing things in this market. The second aspect I would say is that uh, if, if, if you unpeel, unpeel that whole uh, recent innovation in this space, there are to me, there are three things. One is people are asking, can we make the, the process more affordable? And I'll give an example here. Now, uh, four years back, uh, well, we, we, uh, we started with an experiment where we connected our domestic payment system with Thailand, first time. I think still it is only one, only cross, across the border country where two national uh, infrastructure, financial infrastructure, in this case, payment infrastructure are connected directly. And it took us three years to connect Thailand and, and Singapore, despite both the systems had identical design, had the similar uh, uh, particle address based system, which means you don't need to know the bank account detail. You just need to know your mobile phone number to send money to each other. It took us three years to connect this two system. It speaks to the volume of complexity of global market infrastructure. Two countries, identical system, and uh, almost similar process for design and, and willing to agree on streamlining process, it took us three years. Now you just multiply the complexity of number of countries, CLS, uh, SWIFT, all have to deal with. Second, after we connected, here are the direct uh, outcome. First thing, before sending, before we connected Thailand and uh, Singapore, for every $100 somebody has to send from Singapore to Thailand, it used to cost $15 to $20 on a bank rail, banking rail. And it will perhaps take two to three days to, to reach uh, the money other side. So after the connection, the cost of transfer is now reduced to $3 for every $100 of transfer. This including FX. And the so social impact is that now this uh, immigrant workers are able to send more money, more frequently money because they don't have to worry about holding or uh, uh, building certain, certain size of money before the transfer back home. And encouraged by this connection, which we are in the process of connecting to India, connecting to Malaysia, and hope other countries. What, and, and if you think about it, this is not solving or replacing any global infrastructure. It is trying to solve a certain segment of population's demand and need to have a low value, super efficient, uh, cost-effective transfers. Similarly for merchant payments, also similar infrastructure, different private players coming together, trying to find interoperable QR reading system. Why? Because those things don't exist today. So in my, in my thinking, the world is divided into two parts. There's this whole big infrastructure supporting wholesale, interbank, large value transfer, which to me largely is efficient under the existing infrastructure we have. But the second half, which is dealing with small value merchant payments is highly fragmented. It requires a lot of innovation. It requires a lot of streamlining of, of operational legal framework and regulatory understanding so that that can be solved in the near term. So this is where I, I see this whole universe of market infrastructure. Of course, I didn't, I didn't mention about our own, we'll talk about it, uh, our own journey on the whole CBDC, wholesale CBDC as a mechanism or as a possible alternate to some of the global market infrastructure.
we'll talk about it hopefully then I'm sure there will be questions about this. Uh, but uh, but but Mark, uh, how do you react to SOP's uh, description of the world? Do you agree with this kind of division between the kind of tier one infrastructure with a lot of efficiency, but maybe the kind of political tensions you have uh, alluded to, and then a kind of lower level where things are more at the operational level and driven by technology? How how do you think about that? So. Um... There is a first two elements of answers to the point uh, uh, being raised. First, there is a difference between uh, CLS and SWIFT. Just to be very clear, uh, CLS is a settlement uh, entity. So we are a financial market infrastructure providing settlement in central bank. Money. SWIFT is a messaging uh, uh, thing. And we are using SWIFT, by the way. So we, are, we don't have overlap. We are complementary completely. And we don't have the same function. So just to be, to be clear. So yes, there is a difference, I should say, uh, between the challenges and the uh, uh, context in which the retail challenges are and the wall sell. It's two different worlds. Uh, they, they have similarities in the sense because there is cross-border exchange and uh, the difficulty uh, which were just mentioned are true. Uh, they, they are true for both sides, but the challenges are different. And indeed, uh, where you are connected to a mechanism uh, uh, where it has been somehow integrated and completely working, then it's fully safe and it's delivering full service. I was mentioning uh, the, the, the liquidity saving of uh, 99%, for instance, while you have full certainty to be protected on principal risk uh, uh, for the settlement, straight through processing and the uh, simplicity of process. By the way, the cost of settling in this context make that the, the cost per million USD uh, somehow uh, settled is 13 pence. So, I mean, uh, we, we are at level of costs, which are quite uh, quite good. Nothing to do with the retail payment, obviously, that was uh, behind the point and the remittances that uh, were mentioned before. Uh, so, indeed, it's two different, I think, uh, world. Uh, but still, the, the, the way to answer the global context remains the same challenge and remain the same context, whether we want to simplify exchange or whether we uh, support the exchange or not in terms of infrastructure service. That was a point I wanted to, to bring forward. We've been, we've been very clear about that, especially with respect to China. So let's talk a little bit about China. And you've been uh, you've been a practitioner of this also, uh, as I mentioned before, as a regular of the Bank for International Settlements, whereas China uh, through the People's Bank is a, a regular participant, but also with all the ambiguities of their position as a developing country as a, a latecomer to many of the systems and projects and not entirely integrated in some of them in the current geopolitical context, which I don't have to elaborate on, but where the idea of sharing critical infrastructure uh, is, um, is uh, challenged, uh, if not challenging. So if I got you correctly, and correct me if, uh, if that's not the case, what you advocate is more integration of China in at least some of those critical infrastructures. Uh, you mentioned that you know the Chinese uh, currency is an outlier uh, by not being uh, in your system at CLS, and uh, and that creates risk and costs. Uh, how realistic is that? Uh, is there because there's a lot of infor information sharing involved? Uh, a lot of countries uh, maybe are not keen to share information with China. Maybe China is not keen to share information with other countries these days on things that are as sensitive as financial transactions. Uh, there's also governance involved. You mentioned the oversight committee with national authorities. Uh, how does how does all that work? How can it be made to work? And how have you seen it working uh, in your previous duties at the BIS? If you can give us a little bit of a sense of that. Yeah, it's a tricky question, Nicola. <laughs> in a way, but uh, uh, I think the, the main question, we will find a way to make it work, I think, if there is a willingness to make it work. And the point I want to make is that there is a business, or business case, is not, it's a wrong term. There is a systemic relevance to address the issue. That's more my point, in particular with my central banker art in a certain way, the systemic relevance of the challenge is what should be at the heart of the reflection of the policymaker. So it's not so much whether we have the appropriate channel to do it today. Probably we have to reinvent something different from what we have, and we are ready to think to it. But we need first to be around the table and to say, yes, there is a substantial exchange which is systemically relevant to be addressed. And therefore, we need to go around the table and discuss. 
I don't have the solution uh, yet uh, built in and uh, you just turn the key and you are there. I think we have to discuss with the different uh, policymakers on whether there is a willingness to address it. And then we will find solution. We will build the necessary uh, uh, bridges or technical uh, elements or solution, which will be adequately answering the, the context and the specificity even of the relationship of this currency with the other currency. I think we will find solution. When you come to the technical challenge, it's not anymore a solution, even less for technology. Technology is there anyway. We have all uh, uh, state-of-the-art technology uh, ready. The main problem is to make sure that the policymakers have a clear objective and that uh, we want to deliver something efficient and which will preserve from systemic implication of disruption in the, those currencies which are heavily related to the global system. Again, it's very clear on the table, I think. Uh, and again, it, it will be stronger, I think, in the 2022 iteration uh, to be seen. So you, you're in Singapore, obviously, which has a unique position of um, unmatched connectivity with both uh, the China and with uh, Western rich economies. Um, how do you look at this uh, governance challenge? Um, I'm, I, I, I know you may not want to comment on all the geopolitical aspects, but, uh, but, but, but what? How does it look from your window? Well, you know, if you look at, uh, if, if you again make it more, uh, if you remove the noise, I think uh, go by what is publicly available. Uh, what China is doing is building a, uh, a clearing system, which essentially is for one RMB clearing system. Uh, essentially, that's the narrow focus. Now, as Mark said, that uh, it is, it has, it's not technology challenge. It's not technology challenge. It, I think China can build it easily. Uh, a messaging system comparable to or, or a clearing system to any global standard. That's not an issue. The issue is how to get the global community to participate in the network so that there's a transparency, there's regulatory alignments, and there is a whole set of rules which comes uh, and information sharing comes with that. I think that's going to be a discussion, open discussion, continuous dialogue. But in the meantime, I guess this, uh, in the, uh, I'm referring to SIPs, they will continue to uh, make the necessary announcement for somebody who wants to directly settle uh, our, our, uh, yuan on or for for any uh, for cross border trade uh, while they stay connected to global system for dollar clearance i think that that the dual system will remain as it stands today i think more and more importantly I, in my sense if you if you just don't take china as the example you will see more of regional large uh, market infrastructure which which may uh, come together through a consortium or through a participating uh, willing banks but they will have apis or interoperability through apis to talk to each other so they will be different but they're willing to talk to each other using some common layer of of, of interfaces and hopefully those rules and governance and the and the required regulatory alignment will play that will allow that that things to be aligned as they're building the respective alternate uh, system that that's where I think is my take here. But I would say it's too early. I mean, if you look at the volume, it's like 3%, if I'm not mistaken, Mark, uh, in terms of volume. So it's very small. And I think, and plus the not participating banks in that network is to my best knowledge, 1,300 plus, uh, almost 40% in China. Sorry. sorry, yeah, sorry. You mean in SIPs? Yeah. Yeah, so I think if you look at it, it's still a very early stage of uh, of, the, of that of that design construct. So uh, and SIPS, of course, is a cross-border interbank payment system that has been set up by the People's Bank of China and the Chinese authorities. Um, <laughs> I, I'm always uh, I always love doing the acronym police. Uh, so your vision, uh, SAP, is basically that um, technology can resolve, if not all, at least some of the political turf issues, right? Uh, we, we have an API, uh, data can flow there and transit seamlessly between systems, even if the systems are separated. Did yes, I get that right? And, 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 and as long as there's a, there's enough transparency in information sharing, I think the, the good thing about global market infrastructure is the information sharing piece, which is consistent for every market player to have exactly the same set of information. You got to ensure that to have a level playing field. Of course, I'm, I've been a culprit as well. API stands for Application Programming Interface. Um, uh, Mark, do you agree with Sub's uh, point on this? I mean, uh, is it possible to be that optimistic? 
Well, no, no, uh, I'm not sure he's that optimistic. He's telling that the technical challenge is not the big difficulty. And I fully agree with that. We will find ways to do it. It's not that simple. I mean, uh, all the way things are implemented are still uh, with slight differences and slight uh, local uh, specificity. But the technical challenge is not the issue. Uh, that I agree completely with him. The difficulty is to find a, a willingness to interconnect, to get the, the benefit. And to have alternative uh, uh, mechanism does not change the problem of putting everyone around the table to find a solution that could allow exchange of uh, US dollar, uh, eventually euros against uh, CNH, for instance, which are the main uh, pair of currencies which are active on the FX market. I mean, again, uh, looking at uh, the it's FX it's system. It's it's yeah. Sorry to interrupt, CNH is a Chinese currency, but traded in Hong Kong, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's the offshore currency, uh, which is the one mostly uh, traded. So I think it's uh, the large volume of international activity is done in, uh, directly on this offshore version of the yuan, yes. But the numbers in the table uh, is gathering both. Huh? So sorry for the acronyms, yes. Uh, <laughs> and also, uh, Nicholas, uh, sometimes this whole DLT uh, DLT-based uh, experiment in China is overblown also, because uh, there also I think there's some some people frame this as a you don't need all this messaging system you can write into a ledger where said PBOC have a direct access to the ledger. I think those are all experiment. I want to make your audience understand these are all experiment. These are not necessarily an established uh, which you can read much for, as a, as an alternate infrastructure. These are very experimental stage. Yeah, I think it's a Chinese one. <laughs> yeah. Mark, on this? No, no, I, I agree completely. Uh, and uh, it does not replace the necessity anyway to exchange information. Uh, those uh, uh, different, again, it's a different technology implementation of the same problem. The problem remains here. It's not the <laughs> technology will resolve the problem. You need to define the appropriate governance, the appropriate regulatory context, the appropriate legal strengths of what you are building and the willingness to interconnect. So you don't escape this by putting a technology A or B. So whether it's centralized or decentralized does not change the, the problem, I think, in this regard. In, in, maybe DLT will make it more difficult because it becomes... <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. So if you push me on that, I will say more difficult, more expensive and uh, more <laughs> unlikely. So because we have one of our services operating under DLT and we are not very satisfied yeah, with yeah, performance. Yeah. Scalability, and, 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 and it's not easy. Yeah. And your and also, costs are going to go up. And, yeah. and also less environmentally friendly, uh, I guess. Um, I so, that, uh, that I would say, and Nicholas, I'll push back, because that they have solved it. I think that they don't need to worry about the, 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 the proof of the transaction. I think what Mark says is absolutely right. I think the transparency becomes a problem in a DLT infrastructure, strangely. And, and the cost of collateral can go dramatically up. So can you explain us a little bit more you have to, why the cost of collateral goes up? Did you have to put everything on the net, on the net, on, on the network, and, and you just can't uh, uh, put things outside the network. So the full transparency means everybody's over collateralized on both the sides. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, actually, we have a, co uh, a question um, linked to that uh, somewhat. Um, from Pierre Raffi, he's asking about, so he's referring to the initial white paper of the Libra project of Meta, that sounds very old suddenly. Um, so the, the, this initial white paper, which was, I think, 29, uh, 19, was pointing to the issue of international uh, C2C transfers that Sub you mentioned, uh, and uh, suggesting that the Libra stablecoin could be a solution. Um, now, uh, well, he mentions a personal opinion that it's good that this project no longer exists. But the question is, could one solution uh, be a similar construct coordinated by a supranational institution rather than a private consortium? Uh, who, who wants to take that one? Sop? Well, uh, uh, I'll be thoughtful in this response a little bit. Let me, let me think through this carefully, because I, I may say things which can be misconstrued. Well, you know, um, sure. if you are running a super big global in e-commerce platform or some kind of or, or, a, or, a, or a digital uh, uh, commerce uh, marketplace and you have both the buyers and sellers market participant receiver and senders in the same ecosystem by design you can build a closed loop system with your own currency designed in, within that system and you can run a 
a, a, a super efficient payment network, of course, it, it will have a connection to fiat outside the network, but some kind of a stable coin design can be created and that whole ecosystem within the closed environment can self-sustain. It's by, in theory, it sounds logical. It is possible, it is feasible because you have the size and the, and the, and the volume to manage liquidity and manage the, 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 the net flows uh, plus and minuses. But it also, we should, not, we should not underestimate you are crossing border, even if you are a large multinational unit, which means you're going to touch the regulatory jurisdictions of every market where the participants are connecting to the network. And that will be the source of friction for this to succeed. Because when it touches that connection to the real economy uh, outside the network, all the regulatory frictions will come, all the, all, the super, all the supervision frictions will come, and all the necessary governance, taxes, and everything will start piling on. At that point, the, the cost effective of such network will be questioned. I think that's where I, I stand on this network, large network, uh, self-contained closed loop systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely concur uh, to, to what was just said now. And I mean, uh, on paper, it's beautiful. So if you go on Mars and you want to create something new, maybe it fits for purpose. But uh, on the reality of where we are today with this multi-jurisdictional context in which we are, and for good purpose that we have different currency, which are, which have a trust element into the way you, when you hold dollar, you hold dollar that you trust, or when you take euro or whatever currency, Singaporean dollar, you, you trust that the issuer of it has a certain meaning. So you, you cannot just go to any private uh, operator who does it. And should you resolve the global, uh, uh, indeed, governance element, uh, good luck. Uh, uh, I participated, as you mentioned earlier, to the construction of Europe to get the euro among the country of the euro area already was a huge challenge to get the appropriate governance in place and to agree on that. So if you want to replace it, this is at a level of global economy to have the appropriate governance, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and also uh, the price discovery may not be the most efficient because if you have a coin backed by a, by a basket currency, there could be a transparency issue uh, held by a large network. So there are these issues, but in theory, it looks feasible. I'm sure that isn't why it didn't take up. But, uh, uh, but keeping aside that, if you look at why Alibaba and lot, lot, Amazon, a lot of e-commerce do succeed in the retail payment side is because of the same network effect. They could manage both the across the border suppliers and buyers in a closed loop system and they could manage the risk and they could manage inter-company inter for uh, transfers using their own network. So there are examples of large network captive closed loop system, but they are playing by the rules of existing payment system infrastructure. They're just making the process of moving money super efficient cost of transfer super efficient and the risk management much more much more uh, uh, smarter but and we, but yeah so yeah. go ahead uh, but trying to replace uh, that whole ecosystem economic activity with a alternate currency construct is a bit of uh, early stage far fetched yet to be tested um greg buyer is asking if there is any um follow-up reading uh, that you would recommend on SIPs uh, uh, is, <laughs> I guess there's a lot on the web uh, already, maybe not uh, enough. Uh, some of us at the Peterson Institute will probably contribute to that literature at some point down the line. And I commend the work of my uh, colleague, Martin Charles Empa, among others on, uh, on this kind of issues. But, uh, but is there any particular piece of research or uh, documentation that you would recommend to I, I will get put uh, the, more of a I'll, sense of it? I'll put it in the chat. Uh, the one, one article I liked, which kind of, kind of explains where it is, I'll put it in the, in, the, in the chat for people to click and check it out. Yeah, it, it, it may be that the chat is disabled. So uh, actually, oh. if you can put it into queue, um, well, I will, I will advertise it. So uh, I'll monitor the chat. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm not sure everybody has access to it. Um, so. Um, Mark, uh, we mentioned supranational solutions, right? Let's build something at the global level. And, and as you said, uh, you know, easier said than done. But um, there I, are- I just put, sorry, sorry, Nicholas, I just put the link on the okay. question. Okay. Um, so I um, haven't seen it, but um, I will probably uh, end up 
getting it. Um, so uh, anyway, um, on global, you know, uh, global cooperative solutions, there have been some experiences, right? Uh, and uh, and indeed, CLS is one of them, right? Because it, uh, you can give us a little bit of the of the story of how CLS was born. Um, but um, but the point is, um, can you tell us a bit more about those experiences? What have we learned? And I'm not saying just in recent years, but maybe in the last decades or 20th century, about what's possible and what not in terms of um, you know global cooperative uh, joint solutions uh, and the, the associated governance challenges. Um, and uh, and how that can be applied to today's world. I know this is a very all-encompassing, very complex question, but I'd be interested in having your holistic perspective about it. Yeah, we, we could write uh, books on that. Yes, uh, for sure. It's a very wide question. The, so yes, yeah, CLS is a very good example of it. I think uh, uh, there is other entities, as I mentioned in my introduction, who have similar global reach and therefore need to have some form of global governance. Otherwise, they cannot be uh, trusted as a global uh, somehow partner. So CLS was created uh, uh, by uh, somehow a private public sector partnership uh, between uh, the central bank's community, uh, analyzing uh, the uh, principal risk deriving from the global FX uh, settlement uh, process, which was triggered, if you remember, by the Erstadt Bankhaus uh, bankruptcy in the 1975, if I'm not mistaken, and which triggered the necessity to build a mechanism which uh, uh, would mitigate this risk, which was huge. Basically, the risk was the one that uh, payment versus payment would not be available. Huh? And that uh, you, the, the Erstadt Bank risk was in Deutschmark uh, uh, and went bust in the morning while uh, New York was closed and the uh, Deutschmark legs were paid, but not the dollar legs. So they were a huge uh, loss. And this was triggered at the beginning of the market was not systemically so big at that time than it is today. Uh, because global exchanges have increased uh, over the, the last decades. CLS went live. In fact, we, we celebrate this year 20 year uh, anniversary of CLS. So it went live in 2002. So you imagine the time to get from uh, assessing this risk and uh, to go live uh, took quite some time. So it's complex. It's a long journey. And we started just with a few currencies, seven, I think, at the first. Uh, now we have 18 and we are still uh, trying to embark more currencies. I'll give you an example. Uh, so I joined, you said it, in uh, December 2019, and CLS was already on the road to uh, add its 19th currency, which is a Chilean pesos, a bit further on the list that I provided to you, but uh, still there. And uh, uh, since then, we are working on it. It's not difficult technically. There is a political willingness of both parties to get there. But to be able to be connected to the global system, you need to be compatible in law, in regulation, in interpretation, in liquidity uh, capacity to provide uh, uh, when necessary for settlement, in operational context. All this is taking place now, and uh, it's more than four years that we are working on it, and we expect eventually to go live with them uh, eventually next year. So it would be four to five years to go there, but they still need to uh, change some piece of legislation. So it requires even to go to the parliament sometime to be able to interconnect. The technical stuff is piece of cake compared to that. Uh, so it's not really a technical issue or a technological issue again. It's really the fact that the law should be uh, uh, in place and all those elements should come. So you need a political willingness first, and then you need to find a solution to implement. I think it may require effort. The, the key element, by the way, in this are the PFMI, so-called, which are the principle for financial market infrastructure, so you don't catch me on the acronym, which published by the CPMI that we mentioned earlier, so the Committee uh, for Payment and Market Infrastructure of the BIS, huh? uh, where, together with IOSCO, by the way, uh, so the International Organization for Securities and uh, uh, Com Commission, I guess, Securities Commission Organization. Uh, which is providing those standards, which are very important and define the level of safety that we are expecting from uh, market infrastructure. The, the, the fact that you have to come to that, to a degree of integration, which helps to go into the global market uh, is a challenge there. And then you have to find the governance piece that you mentioned. So you have to agree on the way to exchange information and to, uh, to get through uh, those elements. So all this has to come together step by step. And uh, uh, that's what we are working on. But so to embark a currency into a CLS, they take, it's a multi-year journey, depending again on the context in which uh, the country is operated. 
but uh, finality is important. Uh, we need to make sure that when a payment is declared final, it is final. No one will come back on it. Otherwise, the principal risk will not be uh, preserved. And that on its own is a challenge. And again, if you remember, uh, to take an example to generalize the point, not just on CLS, uh, when we created the euro, uh, we had to converge the European laws to get the same settlement uh, rules in terms of finality and had the settlement finality directive dictated by the Commission, the European Commission, to be able to do that and laws had to be adapted to it to do that. Obviously, we were with a strong political project, so there were a strong political push to do it. When you are in a global context, this political push is of a different nature by definition. That's where it's the, the key, if you want. And uh, do we are we able to trigger this so that we want a safe place or, or not? That's super interesting. And of course, we remember that the Herstedt crisis was also the beginning of the Basel Committee, uh, something we have discussed in other uh, se sessions of the series. Let me share, I hope everybody sees it, uh, um, the papers that uh, Sopnendu referred to about uh, SIPs and um, also uh, other aspects of sanctions and SWIFT. This is not an endorsement, but uh, some publicity for the shop next door for us. Uh, and uh, and uh, so that people can uh, can see the reference. Uh, okay, so that I, I'll stop sharing here. Uh, Mark, another question about this um, kind of um, what's possible, what's not. I, you showed us the numbers. The dollar is very dominant. And I think if you look at some other parameters of CLS, the dollar is even more dominant than in, uh, in, in the numbers you showed us on screen. Uh, how sustainable is that? I mean, if a, is it necessarily the case that if you have a global infrastructure that uses some money, uh, it will be dominated by the dollar? How do you think in terms of you know multipolarity, uh, balance? Um, uh, is that entrenched by, uh, you know, regulatory or governance arrangements, or is that purely the, the, the consequence of market forces? Um, uh, what, uh, what about that? So in a, in a, let's assume for a moment that the world is becoming more multipolar. I know there is a debate about this. Um, so, uh, so, so does that, does that undermine or does that uh, increase uh, the case for global uh, and globally integrated infrastructure? Um, whatever the answer, it I think increase anyway uh, the case for global infrastructure to be interconnected. The reality of today trading activity is that most of the trades that you see reported there are against USD. So, uh, so that's the reality of the current FX market. You trade against US dollar, and uh, so there is some other currency which are coming in. Uh, I guess probably the second one uh, is a euro as a counterparty, but far, far, far below uh, the activity. So it is typical, just to understand that, the typical euro Swiss franc transaction is actually a, 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 a pair of a euro dollar and a dollar Swiss franc, correct? <laughs> Uh, I am not sure of that, I should say. I am not a trader on that, but most probably it does because most of the volume we see are against USD. But yeah, I would have a joker on that one. Uh, I'm not on the trading part, I am settling. But the reality no, is no, that but, um, settlement, yeah. settlement is uh, dominantly, and in particular on those currency I was mentioning from the emerging country where we look more closely to the pair of currency trading, we have uh, 90 plus percent of the trades against USD. So it's in this uh, order of magnitude. So the percentage of euro would be a bit bigger eventually on Turkish lira because there is a, a geographic proximity and probably is therefore greater on the Swiss front. But uh, I don't have the data on my side. Here, uh, but happy to share if you, if you wish. I think uh, this, this must be available. Again, on the bigger question, right? Uh, how how do you see the you know uh, the the is there a tension between the fact that the world is becoming more complex, more balanced between different, you know, uh, players and this dollar dominance as enshrined, uh, not just in the in the transactions, but in the way the infrastructure operates, right? Well, yeah, but again, it's a traduction of how the world is working today. Uh, so uh, you see, by the way, uh, and this is a comment from, uh, I would say, not in my position, but just looking at the, the press and how things are doing, the, the fact is that when there is geopolitical tension, uh, the dollar is a refuge somehow, uh, you see it today. So this is a reflex of financial market, I would say. Uh, so 
uh, we may like it or not like it, it's not the point. It, it is uh, today functioning uh, on this basis. Uh, so the, I know there is debate from some other uh, economies uh, to, to make other reserve currencies or to have a greater international role for some currency, which is debatable, by the way. It's not always 100% uh, supported by everyone. So, uh, uh, yeah. The reality is this one today, and uh, that's why uh, CLS has been based as a bank in US, by the way, uh, in New York has been incorporated, is because obviously the main currency being settled is uh, US uh, currency. So that was what was on again when created was uh, when CLS was created uh, 20 years ago. So Andrew, you are uh, clearly on the, I'm not sure if you're on the road or the belt or both, but you're in Singapore and it's in the middle of all oh, that. Uh, so, so, so no. how do you look at that? No, I think it is always seductive to talk about uh, alternative dollar, but I think let's let's try to understand what problem we're trying to solve for. I think that's not the biggest problem we should all worry about. The biggest problem today in the market infrastructure is the infrastructure itself has got a lot of improvement to happen. Starting from the technology, techniques, starting from the processes, the whole operational risk today which still exists in the market infrastructure. The whole set of work we need to focus on to solve that. I don't think for putting uh, putting a mind to a dollar discussion distracts everyone from a real issue. When there are there are uh, banks which runs on legacy infrastructure, they got to find a way to upgrade that infrastructure. There are uh, regulatory policies which can be aligned across jurisdiction. You can put a lot of resources and effort to get that fixed. The third, there are many. Multi, you look at today, for every time you send money, there are four players checking your KYC. Do you need all this four player to do some? Can we just find a streamlined way to, to make that process efficient? There are liquidity trap. Money sitting in different pocket pockets and not being moved around, and therefore they're causing more expensive transfers. So my point is, if you have to channelize your resources to fix a real problem, the resources should be channelized to solve what is possible, which is low hanging, less controversial, but has a real economic value is fix the infrastructure and bring it to a common standard, common, uh, common uh, uh, interoperable infrastructures and regulatory alignment. If you solve that, I think bulk of the need of the economy can be addressed. If once this is done, if you have some time for seductive dialogue, we can talk about dollar issues, but not, not the problems in hand. That's right. Yeah, um, yeah Mark? If I, yeah, no, no, I concur completely uh, with you. And that's what I am calling when I say we need to call for more public-private sector partnership to resolve those problems. I mean, it's, it's so complex and so multidimensional, but public sector has a big part to play. As you said, the regulatory uh, convergence is an uh, absolute must and uh, legal also convergence of, of the way we recognize those uh, uh, exchanges is key for the stability. Uh, then the rest would be easier to tackle afterwards. Yeah, we have uh, 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 an observation by Greg Bayer in the chat saying, uh, maybe the simplest best solution to propel global trade and finance would be for the US to remove all restrictions for use of the US dollar, make it usable by everyone and promise not to introduce any restrictions in the future. Okay. I'll, direct, I'll direct that to the US Treasury Office of Financial Asset Control. Uh, <laughs> any, <laughs> any, 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 that's, uh, that's the bureaucracy in charge of uh, financial sanctions, of course, in the US. Uh, any comments on that? No comment? <laughs> we have another... No, no, wait. Yeah. No, no, not really a comment. I mean, but uh, again, the, the easier we can, uh, uh, I mean, I don't give solution yet, but the easier we can uh, create a dialogue between public private sector to resolve those barriers which exist, uh, who, which barrier they are. I mean, I don't want to be specific at this point, but uh, all of them, so to converge towards uh, similar uh, capacity to exchange uh, is great. So uh, from this angle, uh, yes, the, the authorities of all countries should be uh, somehow uh, looking at this and looking what is the benefit for their economy also. Uh, so selfishly, uh, is it from the interest of the, the uh, in this case, US economy, this example, to be better integrated to those or not? And uh, my take is that when you see the numbers, yes, it is. Because the systemic implications of a disruption uh, in this uh, bilateral relationship would be bigger than probably uh, uh, the fact that we have to handle uh, uh, 
sanction context to take the example of uh, Russia, where we would have to bend down eventually some relationship, but in a clean way. So it would be much stronger for everyone. So, um, so Penu, Singapore participated in the Russia, um, in the sanctions against Russia, including freezing the assets of the Central Bank of Russia. I, I don't know, and you probably won't tell us uh, how much of that was in Singapore, but, uh, but that was part of the collective effort. Um, do you want to comment on that? I, I will pose uh, the I, question in the I, most vague possible way. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm myself not privy to everything what Central Bank does. So, <laughs> so it's, well, so. that's an easy one. <laughs> um, but we have the question from Pierre Rafi. Actually, uh, you know, if, if, if the U.S. dollar is considered a safe haven, um, then you know. Uh, what would be a, uh, is is it going to is it one of the scenarios that can challenge the, the U.S. dollar dominant position? I guess we kind of uh, yes. treated that already a little bit, but uh, if anybody wants to add something, now is the time. No, um, one uh, brief question from an anonymous attendee for you, Mark. Um, how do you see the Belt and Road Initiative impacting the business of CLS? I mean, I mean, this is a easy, 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 easy question. I think the BRA, if the transaction in that BRA uh, corridor will be a, a, a yuan settlement, uh, which I think the the Chinese the Chinese uh, uh, clearing system is trying to address. So, to me, uh, there'll be a system which people can uh, the BRA infrastructure investment countries can use that to settle against yuan. I think that's the more uh, more immediate uh, benefit uh, and what China is trying to solve for. Uh, but I don't think uh, that affects any global uh, construct. How does it work out in Singapore? Can you tell us more about it? Are any Singaporean banks already members of SIPS? Yeah, they are, they are, they are, DBS, DBS Bank, if I'm not mistaken, I, I hope I'm correct. I think the, the, uh, some uh, uh, banks are part of the member of the uh, SIPS systems. And that's presumably something recent or has it been the case for many years? I don't want to say exactly, but they've been there for a while. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and um, I think the, the is that, yeah, I go think ahead. It's, a, I mean, it's publicly available. All the, I think it's, uh, if you read that report, it uh, says uh, two fifth uh, are in China, three fifth outside China, the number of uh, participants in that network. So, I'm sure there are plenty of banks in Asia are direct members of that uh, clearing system. Mark, do you, do you watch the development of SIPs? And, and again, to restate the question, is the Bank Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI in general, um, affecting your business? I don't know how much vol volume it will make materially impactful, but I mean, there is already a flow there. Mark? Mark, is, uh, to, to repeat the question that was asked uh, in the chat, uh, is, uh, is the Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, impacting the business of CLS and how? Oh, no, sorry, uh, I, was, I thought you were discussing uh, with Sam. No, uh, the, uh, I don't think it would. Uh, I mean, uh, in fact, uh, it may help to create the further uh, necessity to interconnect. I mean, should you have a need to settle uh, transactions uh, across currency, then you need to find a solution to do it. So I guess this initiative would somehow increase uh, the necessity to trade and therefore to make exchange uh, against international currency, not to mention the USD in particular. And therefore it would trigger the necessity to find solution for the settlement. So it can help to reinforce the necessity to find solution. Uh, so in this regard, yes, uh, it probably, I mean, we will see again, we have the triannual survey, which will show how much uh, the trading activity on the Chinese currency has increased over the last three years period. Uh, and uh, I'm very interested to see the result when they come. And uh, so we will see whether the problem is even bigger than the, the number I was mentioning earlier. I'm also very um, impatient to see the numbers when they come, uh, only once every three years. So um, it's not like uh, cicadas in Washington, D.C., who come uh, every 17 years, but that's something uh, somewhat comparable. So um, maybe we'll even write about this at the Peterson Institute. Uh, last question, maybe, on um, data. Um, 
I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of sensitivity on data and the fact that we now have technologies like, you know, big data analysis and, and the like that, you know, uh, make it possible to handle huge amount of data and, and distill information from them, at least in principle. Um, and of course, that's used for surveillance, that's used for um, even, you know, espionage, hacking, what have you. Um, does that change the landscape for you? Does that make financial data infrastructure, which basically also infrastructure we're talking about are in some to some degrees uh, more difficult to handle or easier to handle. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of that? How the how the the, the new attention to data, including from non-specialized, non-financial policymakers, uh, is uh, is uh, you know facilitating or uh, making more difficult the kind of global working together that we've been talking about in this hour. Maybe Sop and then Mark. Well, um, well, of course, I think the uh, SWIFT, if you take example of SWIFT GPI, how it has changed uh, uh, the way now people can see information uh, uh, more, more, much more on the network. Well, uh, with technology data, um, you have both sides. You have much more the, Better transparency. You can you can do more analytics. Also, it also exposed to cyber hacks and cyber issues. So it's a dual problem. In one part, it is an opportunity. Other part, it brings a tremendous risk to the network. And a lot of the endpoints of this network are not necessarily the most secure one. You have to you have to understand that these systems are all connected to different endpoints. And uh, these endpoints are not necessarily the most, are different stages of maturity, different level of. Of, of secure sec from information security and cyber cyber resiliency perspective. So with that rise of data, with better access to data, better access to technology can process data. I think there's a need to think about how to make it secure, how to ensure these data are available in a way it is not only useful but also uh, it does it doesn't fall into wrong hand and uh, cause unintended consequences. And this is where I think my short answer to this uh, big data technology, access to the network, access to information. And, and, and I think we should not forget all the global market infrastructure are highly interconnected systems. And you can actually cause immense damage by just uh, attacking few of these nodes and making it difficult. Thanks, so, uh, Mark, do you have any yeah, more so uplifting uh, thoughts? You know, I know uh, uh, I agree with what was said before, but uh, I will add indeed the protection of data is a key element uh, in the way we build our systems. Uh, uh, so we invest a lot uh, personally in CLS in particular, but in FMI in general, and you can find this again in the principle for financial market infrastructure published by the CPMI that I mentioned earlier, there is very strong resilience requirements on the capacity to protect, uh, so cyber resilience in particular, uh, the access to data. So we, we obviously fulfill all regulations on that and be careful uh, on the way data is being uh, protected and uh, invest on the protection uh, as much as we can to, 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 to have a very strong resilience uh, to that. Now, this being said, data also is very useful. So we are providing capacities for our settlement member to have data analytical capacities and with anonymized data also are providing to uh, eventually people like you uh, uh, the possibility to data mine, uh, so academics uh, or uh, uh, analytical work being conducted by uh, different institutions could also get access to some data with anonymity obviously uh, uh, provided to get uh, the necessary uh, yes analysis of the functioning of the market. So data is, uh, is twofold in these regards, but for sure we have to make sure we respect uh, all the protection of data and make sure that it's on a safe protection. Actually, we're already past the hour. Uh, I have the feeling we only scratch the surface of um, uh, one of the topics I personally uh, find most fascinating in uh, today's financial world. But thanks so much to Mark Bell de Gessé, to Sopnendu Mohanty for having been so candid and uh, for your engagement in this conversation. The next uh, session of financial statements will be not in two weeks as usual, but in three weeks' time uh, at, on. Um, uh, July 27, with, uh, where we'll discuss uh, China's international lending with Brad Parks of Aid Data, who has looked a lot at both the demand and the supply of uh, Chinese lending. So, the, what uh, for, uh, what for, forms it uh, from a Chinese and also from a recipient country perspective, 
Um, uh, I look forward to seeing you all back uh, in that uh, session. And in the meantime, um, have a great month of July. And again, many, many thanks to uh, Sop Mohanty and Mark Day. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you very much. much. Bye bye. Thank you.